Hi everyone, welcome. So Steve, what are we going to talk about this week? We were talking about getting back to the, the color demo. Steve, you had some more ideas on fabric. Yeah, that was a question that came up a while and back. And color. Steve was drawing some fabric this last week and was like, oh my gosh, I realized all of the things, I'm learning so much, and I realized all the things I should have talked to people about fabric, so. The fabric of existence? Of course. What other fabric is there? And Cabby says, by the way, congrats on your new MTG work. It's beautiful. Thank you. It's gorgeous, is actually what Cabby Boy said. Thank gorgeous. you. I, I'm pretty happy, and they are on good cards. Oh, Steve is demanding his today. doodle. <laughs> you ready for your wow. J-doodle? I think that's a first. Well, I'm going to do this. I, I'm going to kind of do a random thing here. Besides Steve Argyle, who is your favorite artist? Just off the top of your head. I know you have a lot. Yeah, I Therese know you have Nelson. a lot here. Trace Nielsen. Okay. Good choice. People, you guys have heard about Steve's Lopalops. Um, a Lopalop is an angel that is too fat to fly. And so he uses other means of transportation to try to fly. Like, you know, like balloons or jetpacks, explosives, catapults, parachutes. Yes. What I would like y you guys to do is draw your version of a lop a lop trying to fly. So come up with some sort of flying device and your version of an angel that's too fat to fly. And um, Steve, you need to draw a lop a lop in Therese Nielsen style. <laughs> In Therese Nielsen style. <laughs> if you can try, if you can. You, you already In know how to draw minutes. a lop a lop. It's a lop a lop, Steve. What else am I supposed to do? How am I supposed to shake this up? Come on, Steve. That's easy. You can do that. It's just you Therese Nielsen. You may have seven stumped minutes. me. Maybe a simpler for time wise might be like, um, like a Picasso. <laughs> Picasso. Another artist. I can do that type. in five seconds. <laughs> Yeah, Steve, I apologize. I didn't realize I was throwing you under the bus with No, he did the Picasso. Okay. Oh, you are Picasso. Yep, that's okay. my Picasso. I thought you were still working on the Therese Nelson. Steve also signed it and said $1 million. Picasso. <laughs> that was very accurate. See, the hard part is that Therese Nielsen's style is a rendering style. It's hard to just do a sketch in Therese's style. I know, I'm a jerk. But it's your, it's your creature, it's your creation, so I had to mix it up somehow. M. Dizzy said, a Dali lop a lop, Steve. <laughs> I can do that too. Bakari said they'd like to hear stories of you starting out as an artist. Mm. Oh, okay. Um, I didn't really start out the same way most people do. We've chatted a little bit about that, but mm -hmm. um, I, I went the wrong direction. I started with technical stuff. I was in school for chemistry, and was working my way through and just taking whatever odd jobs in the uh, classified ads in, um, in the summer times to try and work my way through. And I noticed that a lot of these little odd jobs that people didn't uh, hire people full time for but needed all the time was uh, art stuff, basically just graphics. And so I was doing a little bit of that here and there and that's when it started occurring to me that you could do this for a living. Okay, I think to do a Therese Nielsen angel, I need seven hours, not seven minutes. <laughs> okay. Um, Dan did a good summary of, of, your, of your, your work history. He says, you cheated your way into a job you didn't know how to do and then learned from everyone so you weren't just a poser. That's pretty accurate, yeah. Steve oh. used to work for a game studio as a 3D modeler, actually. So what happened was um, all those classified ads, I finally found one, or rather I didn't find one, but there was one that was looking for a full-time studio position doing cinematics and pre-rendered animations for video games. And I thought, that is the coolest thing ever. But of course, yeah, there's no way that I'm going to get that job. But I went in and I interviewed and Totally, totally conned my way into a job. I didn't technically lie about anything, but I definitely misled them as to what I knew. Steve did 3D video game stuff before he started doing illustration. I learned a lot doing 3D that is not really traditional. Like, for example, especially back then in 3D, you had to do everything one tiny step at a time. Back then, nobody knew how to do anything. It was more or less new. The people who knew how to do it weren't sharing their knowledge, not because they were stingy, but because the internet was brand new. That's how old I am. That's how long this has been. And uh, I can't draw and talk at the same time. I don't know why I keep trying. 
I've always doodled to some degree, but I, I didn't really take art seriously until I was in my mid twenties. But you've always arted. And... I have always arted. My my whole life I've arted to some degree or another, but mostly like everybody else who uh, will doodle on their sketchbooks. All right, oh, sorry, Steve. notebooks and stuff. Okay, that's that's your Dolly near and Therese Nielsen. That that's a. I'm not gonna say that's Therese Nielsen because that would make her feel bad. So, so we're just gonna say that was me wasting time for a few minutes. Oh, that makes me feel bad. <laughs> Commercial break? All right, this commercial break is brought to you by Rubber Duckies and the number nine. We're gonna start number uh, uh, number I, of the day. Well, I figure if it works for Sesame Street, we can use numbers here. Now we return to Steve. Yay, our regularly scheduled programlings. When we were talking about color, one of the things I was starting to get to, color can have many purposes. And one of the things that I use it for constantly that I don't actually see a lot of other people using is I will use it for, I'm not even sure how to phrase it, I will use it as a, a way to identify what direction a surface is facing. Even without having different values, if you have different colors that indicate what direction something is facing, the surface that you're working on, what, what direction it's facing. So, you know, blue is pointing that way, and green is pointing that way, and yellow is pointing that way, purple is pointing that way, then you can get away with a lot of things you wouldn't get away with um, as far as value goes. Now, value is very important, but you can push things a lot by uh, taking the, the colors and using those as directionality. Rims like that says, uh, rims actually kind of put it in a good way. It's cool idea like lighting with gels in photography. Well, that's actually exactly where I got the idea from is when I render things, I do one light source at a time and I usually will, will have some color to that light source. If you look at how like Pixar or any of the, the old school animation studios do things, they'll use classic lighting setups for digital things, which eh, a lot of folks are starting to use more workarounds because they're just faster in the production line, which is totally fine. But you can learn a lot from the guys like Pixar where they'll say, okay, well, we're gonna we're gonna have our scene. Here's our here's our little room. We're gonna pretend it's a set, and they build things like their sets rather than like they would be in real life. Um, and you got like a little window, something in the middle. And the first thing they would do is they would make a light back here and it's just big enough to go through the window because you don't want to have extra calculations or whatever, and then you'd have, hang on, we just need a, we need something dark to work on since we're talking about light sources. So what you'd get from that is just a little bit of light hitting this thing. And these days you can, you can tell it, turn on global illumination or, or physical rendering or whatever, and it'll just do the rest for you. Back in the day, they would have to say, okay, so now all we have is this and it doesn't look like much at all. So the next thing we're gonna do is create a whole nother light right here that basically points straight up and they're using what light is hitting the floor as another light source. Say the floor has got a little bit of a, it's got green carpet, so it's gonna take a little bit of that color and it's not gonna be as bright. And so when it bounces up, as its own light source, it's gonna get a little bit of that green and it's gonna bounce up on these white walls just a little bit. And then they'd say, okay, well that still doesn't look like a room. That's our sun light source. They say, well, we also need some, some blue sky coming outside. So this is really diffuse light source and it's gonna be all over the place, barely obscured by anything because the outside sky is very big. <laughs> the point is that the way I learned to do things was taking every tiny little piece one step at a time. One light source at a time, one, one property of a drawing at a time, like first you do composition and you don't worry about any details or anything like that. Then you worry about some of the structure and then you worry about the characters and then you worry about mm -hmm. their costumes and then you worry about light and dark and then you worry about color and you just do one thing at a time and then none of it's really that hard. You can just keep going with this, like if there's any clouds and the sun's getting through the clouds, it's gonna scatter and it's gonna change the light source and that's when you get these fun warm edges coming around. 
that soften things. Sunlight is, when it's a direct, clear sky day, it's very direct and it has hard shadows. But if there's any sort of clouds or it's sunset, so it's getting more scattered, you get a lot more interesting effects. And like when we did the surfaces episode, it's that same thing of first you do the basic diffuse and then you do highlights and then you do reflections and you can, since we're working digitally, you can do all those things just one step at a time and layer them. These layers are great. Everybody has a different way that makes sense to them. Some people like drawing uh, from light to dark. Some people like dark to light. Uh, it's whatever makes sense to you. There's no right and wrong way of, of doing this stuff and that's part of why it's awesome and it's also part of why it's hard is there's no if you do things this way it will work so here we'll do a little bit of fabric let's do fabric so steve was like i said um steve was doing a bunch of fabric this last week and was like oh my gosh this is what i should have told them and this is what i should have and i was like are you writing it down did you take notes <laughs> You should take notes. I didn't though, because I was really busy and I was like, I oh, don't gosh, stop yeah. for anything. So. Asterox says they understand. They like seeing new art on magic cards and other things. <laughs> Amen. All that stuff I did about a year ago. That's one of the weird things about um, working professionally is when you finish something, nobody gets to see it forever. By the time they see it, you're like, oh, right. I yeah, yeah, I remember. I, I think, I yeah, I remember doing that. Also, you hate it because it's like, well, I would do it way different now. <laughs> I've learned so much since then. Hi. So how much lag, like, I mean, they give you enough head time, when, right, in advance. I can't speak. They give you advance notice, obviously. That makes two of us. How much lead time? So, like, they say, okay, we want the picture done by this date, and then by that date until, like, release time. What's the delay, roughly? It depends on the company. If we're talking about magic, it's about a year. So, um, you, so you really do kind of have time to forget what you did. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. What we got here is just a handful of the anatomy of fabric, right? You've got you got tension wrinkles, and that's when you're you're actually draping stuff around something and it's pulling it together. And then you have compression wrinkles where you're crushing something together. Gravity compression. I'm gonna show you a little bit of that because that's where it's sort of folding in on itself. And then you have wrinkles that are just there in the fabric to begin with, which give you a little bit of uh, turbulence. That's the part that, as I was painting this thing that uh, you'll see in a year, I was like, oh, that's what I should have, that's the thing that I've never heard anybody else talk about. Turbulent wrinkles, which is, I there's gotta be a better word for them. Essentially what the, the little turbulent wrinkle thing is, is it's one step beyond what is already working to make it look more realistic. You already have to have the other stuff in place, all right, so you got this little toga. This works. If you were to finish rendering this out, it would look like fabric. People would, would not complain. But what, what happens in real fabric most of the time is it's not perfect and it's not gonna follow everything just right because as clothes wear and tear and fabric, even when it's made, it has imperfections. And those imperfections make little weak points and strong points so gravity doesn't affect it uniformly and the things that it's draped around aren't affecting it uniformly. So instead of everything kind of flowing like liquid, you get these these breaks in things where it almost folds and it'll, it'll sort of wig waggle back and forth and bunch up in spots so it's not nearly as as perfect and uniform and especially in places like down here where it's getting squished. It's got gravity working on it and it's got this whatever rope they're using to tie it and it's kind of being pulled this way when it has a lot of forces working on it and none of them are particularly stronger than another, that's when you're getting more of these turbulent juice. Is that, is that the actual technical term? Yep. Because uh, I'm going to call it that from now on. Because I just made it up. It's my technical term. So Robert the fifty fifth says that we should that you should do a Kickstarter game for your lot Kickstarter for a lop -a lop board game. I actually have a prototype for a lop -a lop board game. It's tentatively called Mess of the Minions. The premise is you are of course a minion. Each minion is from a different kind of faction. So you have an angel minion, you have a demon minion and a goblin minion or whatever. You are with your patron god at a convention. They have left you alone in the hotel room while they go off to do their convention-y things. And you are with all of the other minions and you have a party. You guys wake up and you have made 
a colossal mess of your god's various um, important artifacts and things. You know, you've you used Thor's Margaritaville, and you can't find it under the mess. And so it's it's a board that's that's full of um, it's basically covered with little tiles that are all mess counters. They're like um, all the junk, and you are trying to clean up all of it and find the the artifacts underneath. But you're also a little bit trying, to, so it's cooperative in that way, because if the gods come back to this mess, you're all fired. Um, if only one of the areas is a mess, then only that particular faction is is messed up. So it's cooperative in the sense that if there's still a mess, you're all screwed. But if there's, uh, if the mess is cleaned up, then it's more about who's still got missing pieces and such. We're gonna do a little commercial break really quick. Commercial break is brought to you by Scott. This commercial break is brought to you by the Magic of Copic Blending Markers and the Eye of Sauron. So, Steve, that is a pretty cool toga. We'll get back to other stuff soon, but you, you get the idea. You sort of just break up the shape. So the overall flow is still there, but you've got these little weak points and breaks where things bend and fold, even though there might not necessarily be something, something there to bend it or fold it. it it's a result of the imperfections in the material itself. And the more forces on a thing, the less likely you're gonna get these because the force is overwhelming it and it's stretching it or pulling it or pushing it. So anyways, it's just a thought to um, to consider as you're doing your own fabric. <laughs> M. Dizzy said that they are totally doing a lop a lop cannon. How did you know? <laughs> <laughs> I'm saying, this is a fat guy toga. I just decided because kind of bulges out there. You know, now that I, I look at this, if he's fat, then the fabric doesn't make sense anymore. I know. It I was thinking be stretching. that. Stretching. See. But that's a lesson, yeah. That's the lesson. This needs to be baggy, else none of that stuff makes sense. Do you want to try one more little? Do little you mini lesson? One more mini lesson. Sure. What you guys want to know? Somebody asked about what it's like to do this as a as a living, and it's a lot of juggling. There's so much stuff to do all the time, and it's not just drawing things. Like when you first start out. It's a lot of drawing. And that's why um, if you follow artists, you'll see that when they first start getting noticed, um, you'll look at their their social media or whatever, and they'll just have like a sketch a day, and they'll have a nice finished painting twice a week, and they're doing fan art, and they're doing this, and they're doing that, and then suddenly nothing. You're just like, now they're working on this cool thing, and you're really excited, because that's how you found them. They're working on, uh, concept design for movies, or working on your favorite video game, whatever, and then they just go silent. It's because your, your workload gets big, but it's what I never realized at the time was it's way more than just the art part. You have so much management to do, and you have, you're suddenly spending hours a day um, emailing and stuff like that, just trying to either negotiate stuff or work out details on on what your client needs, or a variety of other things. And for freelance artists, it's also a lot of self-promotion. You have to, to have social media presence, you have to go to events and, uh, and all this. And like all that is, is fun and cool and rewarding in itself, but you, you're dividing your time every day into so many tiny chunks. Anyways, that was kind of a tangent. Yeah. And we can start doing our squirm work. The squirm work topic last week that you had was Invader Zim invading another IP. So Steve, do you want to show us your squirm work first? Sure. And that's part of the reason I think Steve is wearing his Invader Zim hat. Dang, that and he's just is so excited about the Invader Zim. Invader <laughs> Zim finally has the tools he needs. <laughs> when he get, he gets a hold of the uh, the box to make all the, the Mr. Meeseeks. The Mr. Meeseeks to help him. So if you don't know the reference, it's Invader Zim invading... Earth C-137. Oh, wow. How specific, Steve. Listen, I know my it, It's stuff. invading Rick and Morty. Yeah, that's Steve's Rick and Morty one, and I really like it, and that's hilarious. Two of my favorite dark cartoons. All right, next one. Awesome. This is... Uh, Sir Cheech? Sir Cheech. Chich. 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 I. Chich. Hard eye. Sorry. Oh my gosh, I love it. Awesome. I like that he's got the full Urkin, uh, like, spider arms, too. <laughs> I like it, Sir Chaich. I think you did a really good two, like, job of capturing the facial expression. Of both of them. Yeah, mm -hmm. both of them, which is, like, that's solid. This is Cabby Boy. Wow. Where do I know this from? 
like this. It's a gur head on the it's side. A, well, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's like it's a gur hitting. But the 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 composition looks like a like a movie poster or something. It's like Pacific Rim and Vader's M. Right. Which I like. I'm just oh, it's Evangelion. <laughs> that's oh, it. Okay. okay. Yeah. Because that's great. <laughs> it's that's a, awesome. It is totally Ava, it, it, and and you totally captured it. Because Steve's like, I know I've seen this. That would be a terrifying well, Ava. I, well, I love the fact that a I think it's just Ava. cool. Yeah, the scale of the, of the gur. And here we have, oh, <laughs> the, Game the of Iron Thrones. Throne. That's terrifying. I wonder if the dragon will be my friend. Very nicely done. Come back, and the dragon, ice wall. I love to do. Lannister Zim as well. <laughs> <laughs> Robert the Viking put it. Oh, Astaroxo says he's Tyrion. Okay, uh -huh. okay. Cause, yeah, and, and yeah, Robert even short. said that. He looks like a Lannister. He always got the crest, yeah. This is Scott's. The crown of doomy doom. Wow, you're getting better in a hurry there, Scott. Well, thank you. That's awesome. Oh, doom 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 doom. That's adorable. I'm I'm very excited to throw the smack down with that. Hasn't been played yet. <laughs> Here's Jamix. Oh, Jamix um, was asking if he could just post. Um, mm -hmm. He worked really hard on this in this last week, and so yeah. that's what he worked on for Squomwork, which I think that's a pretty cool little design doc. Yeah, looks sharp. Yes. I really like your color scheme. Drawing mm -hmm. from the Horsemen of the Apocalypse, the mountain archons of pop culture. He said he put a lot more into, uh, effort into this than any other art project of late, so he wanted to share, which we're okay with. Yeah, and it, it shows too. You can tell that you're putting energy into it, and it's worth it. This is Gypsy Tuna Fish. Zim invades my hero academia. Oh, look at the little girl at the <laughs> bottom. <laughs> <laughs> this man is an imposter. That's awesome. That's adorable. Uh, the gur, the gur is killing me. It's just entirely too adorable. Anime style mashup is like, yeah, <laughs> I like that. It, it, it's cool seeing the two IPs kind of hit. <laughs> yeah, it's a good blending, a very, very good job of blending the two different styles. I just want that gur. Here we have Dan. Out of the way, Klingons! <laughs> Out of this mine! Klingons, I'll get the scraper. Uh, boo. I mean, yay, but boo. <laughs> Bringing in the Star Trek, mm -hmm. good, good, and it's got the. I like that it has the Zim coloring, like the the super super saturated color. Sir Chich said they watched rewatched Zim season one this week. It's ninety percent yelling. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, so good though. Here we have Pokemon Zim from M Dizzy. <laughs> oh, and he's got the the Pokeball, mm -hmm. and he's done more in the Pokemon style yeah, too. A little mm -hmm. backpack and all the nice, yeah, great. I detail love work. the the Pikachu gur. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> Which is, and that's exactly how it would be too. It's super cute. Pika gur. So that's all the squam work. Um, we'll have one. one later from um, Poison. And then we'll do the J Doodle. All right, our J Doodle topic was your take on a lop -a lop which is an angel that is too fat to fly and uses <laughs> alternate flying um, flying devices. This is Search H. Did I get it right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I'm gonna steal that. That's very clever. Those wheels are brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean for this, but Steve's trying to make an alternate for his angel. It, it's a lop lop with just a bunch of balloons stuck to him. But he's trying to think of an alternate because he does for his Patreon. He'll do an alternate version of every card. Well, that one's almost done. It's gonna be a pirate, sky pirate. I like that contraption a lot. Well, yeah, but, I'm but stealing Steve, this for for another one. I was about to say, Steve, when are you not gonna? Are you never gonna draw a lop a lop again? This is Cappy Boy. It's Aww. super cute, and it's it's just got holding two little feathers. <laughs> it's so cute and sad and adorable. It kind of looks like an Avis and the Purifier lop a lop. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Is that intentional? Because totally. Cause it's, it it's totally does look cute. like an Avison one. That's so cute. I want that as a card altar. And here we have Asteroxo. It's very clever. This one, this Lopalop decided to recruit some friends. <laughs> it's the Smartalop. Mm hmm. Charismatic. Mm. It's like, hey, you know it'd be better than flying by yourselves carrying me. I'm That's good people. Better. Try it. What did I miss? Oh, I like it. Is that one Asteroxo? Mm hmm, it is. I like it. Yeah, you... I like the texture to the rope. Here's Scott. He has the. I like Dali lop a lop. It doesn't have a, a flying option. I just when you said the Dali Dali lop a lop, that's what I heard. His his kimono is on backwards, Scott. Is it backwards? Uh huh. That means he's dead. 
<laughs> well, he's an angel. He is dead, right? No, that's, maybe. That, that's a good point. Maybe. Own it, Scott. It's intentional. I mean, it's yes. Like, well, he's an angel. It's, Obviously, he's not still alive. It's a statement. I, I'm being a little bit mean because when I did L5R for the first year or two, that was just a constant thing I would get back from the art director. It's like, you have their thing on backwards. Again. Oh, uh, and you need to hold Scott to that higher level. Because <laughs> he's Japanese. We accidentally, well, I accidentally did that in Japan once because I know how to fold it, right? Oh, and <laughs> when I'm looking at it as a painting, it's if it makes a lowercase y, it's correct. We are at some kind of a spa or something, put on my little kimono, <laughs> and I look in the mirror and I'm like, okay, no, I have it backwards, it needs to make a y but I'm looking in the mirror. So I had it right and then changed it to be backwards and people kept like pointing and saying weird stuff and I was like, I don't know what you're saying. I, I'm sure I've got this right. And then I realized that, oh right, mirror. This is... Jimmick. Jimmick, this is Jimmick, okay. Is this, is this Apocalypse? I was thinking like the Arch Archangel. Archangel, yeah. I think that is does. That... Angel used to deal with Apocalypse to get stronger wings. Yes. A lop, -a -lop <laughs> went to Apocalypse. That's awesome. Because you make the deals with Apocalypse oh, yeah. to, to make yourself a tougher mutant. And so because his wings couldn't let him fly, Very I clever. like it. Very clever. <laughs> and then he also murder sources people right. with them. How many people can he murder before he can't fly because he has no feathers left? Has that been addressed in the comics? Doesn't he regrow them? I feel like it needs to. Well, but how fast? Here we have gypsy tuna fish, <laughs> jetpack wings, and and how? How fast does he want to fly, or she? Um, oh. obviously pretty high. They got the cyborg face, so they can go yeah, into space. I love the little a little halo on the antenna. <laughs> oh gosh, that's very nice touch. The flames are good. I I'm very envious yeah. of flames. That's something I need to work on. Every time I try to draw fire, it looks like a bale of hay. Pandalopalop. Pandalop. It's adorable. Super cute, he's all panda-y. Mm-hmm, she beat you on that. You were still drawing while she was, mm -hmm. when she got that in. That's the one that, it was so fast that Kat accidentally mislinked it as <laughs> Yes, the, everyone the got to see that. Everyone got to see links for the panda lop lop Halo cause reasons. <laughs> Aww, so cute. This one's Dan's. Aww, he got a friend too. <laughs> when in doubt, get someone else to do it. Get Charizard. I, was say, I, I think I see an arena battle coming between Pokemon Lopalops. Yeah, it almost seems like he's he's getting a free ride, but he's going to be used as a bludgeoning instrument. <laughs> a ride I will give you, but a price you must pay. <laughs> oh, you guys are so brilliant. This is Bakari's. Wow. You always get so far in our, in our little episode. And the little backlight and everything. I'm just like staring at it. Is that yeah. not saying anything? I'm just like, ooh. That's super cool. You always have like this really, like excellent use of the contrast. I love, I love the contrasting, like the the strong light and the shadow areas and stuff in your pictures. Bakari developed a workflow. That's why they get so far. Can you teach me? Because I don't have a workflow. <laughs> I just start and I'm confused throughout most Maybe of you my can trade. every time. And there's an MDZ. Cannon by MDZ. Aww. Oh. That's an ambitious <laughs> method of flight right there. And they've got pr they, they've got eyewear, proper eyewear. <laughs> He's got goggles. He's fine. This so is, she uh, can come and this get her is the lop -a lop that was on fire in the background of the earlier picture. <laughs> <laughs> this could, is this uh, just pen and ink or is that digital? I can't quite tell. I'm Looks digital sure from digital. here. Digital, yeah. Which is good. To might, they might be using the lazy Nazumi. Which, if so, bravo. Here we have poison stripes. Bumblebee wings. Aww. Must fly, must fly, must, must fly. fly. He looks like he's trying so hard. Think light thoughts. Trying so hard. Yeah, again, really good use of the expression. Like, you can see that concentration. And the hands. Really the effort. He is working at it. Um, well, I think that's everybody. Did we miss anyone? So if, we, if I missed you, let me know. Panda sent a Zim drawing. That's under, so Panda, I had her in two spots. Oh. <gasps> oh my gosh, that's adorable! <laughs> Below Stitch and Zim, or Gur. That's awesome. Oh. Can, can you imagine the chaos that is about to unleash on this planet <laughs> with those two? Oh gosh, mm. it'd explode. <laughs> Zim and Stitch would be so terrifying together. Oh my god. Well, I guess Gur and Stitch. Yeah. Power Ranger Zim. Mmm. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is like, scary. Uh, He's like, no, but for reals, I really am going to conquer this planet. 
That's great. I, well, I didn't like that he's a Power Ranger, but he also has what's her name staff. The uh, what are the witch lady, whatever. Yeah. And this is the homework from last week. It was redoing a card. End of Anubis. Very nice, oh, Poison. Very cool. Yeah, Poison wasn't able to be on last week. She was sick, like me, so she was catching up. Yeah, poor cat's been miserable all week. The cold. Mm, stupid cold. Stupid yeah. human. Filthy humans. All right, I think awesome. we got everyone's stuff now. Thank you guys. Oh wait, I have to think of some homework, don't I? You have to think of squirm work. Hmm. That was. What's our one idea? Cause one I... idea was um, everyone's lop a lop cleaning up a room, and if they don't have their own lop a lop, they can do a normal lop a lop, which is the angel too fat to fly. Mess of the minions. Your your minion ID card or one that you make up cleaning up a mess. So it's that it's that cutesy cartoony style that Steve does. It doesn't have to be in that style. I, it doesn't have but. to be. So yeah, the mess of the minions as the homework. Maybe that'll inspire me to get uh, get some work done on that board game. Maybe. It was super awesome to have you all. Thank you for spreading the word and bringing friends and coming and joining us. Thank you for arting. We think arting makes the world all better. Remember Steve's website, www.steveargyle.com. Uh, come back and visit us again next week. Thanks for joining us, guys. Yep, make sure to get caught up on all your new awesome TV shows that we're so excited for. Mm -hmm. And we'll uh, see you next week. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.